Thanks again for joining us today. Um, today we have our guest speaker is Mr. Tommy Moreno. He's the Chief Operating Officer for Sonify Solutions and the Operations Executive for Colony Capital, a leading global real estate technology and entertainment investment firm with over $40 billion in assets. Mr. Moreno helped lead Colony's acquisition and post-bankruptcy turnaround of Sonify, formerly known as LodgeNet. A leader in interactive media and technology products for the hospitality and healthcare industries, which serves 50 million travelers and approximately 1.2 million hotel rooms annually. Prior to Sonify, he partnered with Colony to, act, to acquire the Miramax Film Studio from Disney and led the company's worldwide operations, growing the business from two to 150 plus employees and ultimately selling the company to BN Media Group. Previous to that, Mr. Moreno spent 12 years at the Walt Disney Company, where as the Vice President of Corporate Strategy, he led strategic growth investments in Hong Kong Disneyland, Disney Vacation Club, and the Disney Cruise Line. He then moved to an operational role overseeing, overseeing $2 billion in revenue at the Disneyland Resort. Before Disney, Mr. Moreno was a captain in the United States Air Force, managing the design, development, and implementation of advanced technology programs and global intelligence systems. He holds an MBA from the Harvard Business School, and all this is quite remarkable given his start as a Zoomie from the United States Air Force Academy. So yes, rivalries are always fair game. So please, a warm welcome for Mr. Tommy Moreno. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me okay in the back? Great, great. Uh, thanks for those, that nice intro and the kind words. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, it's, I'm new to the Notre Dame family. I have a, a son who's a sophomore and a Mendoza student, and uh, I didn't go to a tr traditional college. I went to the Air Force Academy. But I feel a little bit of a connection here. Uh, I, I served with some great young officers when I was in the Air Force, and there was a good number of them that went through the program here and went through the ROTC program, and I always felt that a, a bit of a common bond with them, because just sort of the leadership training that they went through here, the culture, you know, service the country, service to others, and so just very, very uh, proud to be here, and, and thanks for taking the time to, uh, to, 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 to hear my talk, and, and I look forward to engaging with you, and, and please feel free at any point in time to uh, ask any questions, anything's, anything's fair game. I have a little bit of a structured agenda, but we can go off topic. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons I'm also here is I, I really enjoy speaking to undergrads, to MBAs. Uh, I, I found the mentorship that I got when I was in your shoes uh, did a lot for my career. And uh, it wasn't that long ago when I was sitting in similar chairs as you are and listening to guest speakers and they'd all talk about all their opportunities, challenges they overcame. Uh, but the one thing that I always found really interesting and, and, and fascinating at some, some level was just there's personal stories and, and not, the, not the, the subject matter that you all learn in the classroom, which you're gonna be well prepped for that. This curriculum here is outstanding. It's, you know, it's a world-class business program. I didn't have that chance at Air Force. We had to take, um, we had a management major. We're all engineers for the most part, so they sprinkled a few marketing and finance classes, but you have uh, a great uh, training ground here. The, uh, but I found their, their stories about how they made certain decisions and how they connected with people and they led. And what you'll see is that's so critical, just knowing how to relate to different people and different organizations, different cultures. And so I'll, I'll, I'm gonna share with you a little bit of my own personal experience. I mean, I'll start from the beginning and sort of work my way through and, and, and just share with you some lessons that I've learned. And, um, and I do this a lot at the Air Force Academy with the cadets, and, and I welcome any of you, you know, during the, the, the talk and afterwards, if you want to exchange information, I, I, I like, you know, if they're ever in the LA area, I mentor cadets and who are young officers, and they, they transition to the business world, and happy to talk about the entertainment industry and, and some of those experiences. So, any questions so far? It's all good? I don't have any jokes about the Navy, so I have to leave it at that, but... Uh, but we'll, we'll get started. Um, let's see here. So as far as the agenda, I'll give you a quick intro on my background. I'm gonna give you a really high level like career path. 
And you're going to probably pick up a few things that, that you may start to wonder, maybe that's sort of what could happen to me. Uh, I'll focus a bit more on my Hollywood time. That, that's the Disney experience and the Miramax film studio. I think people find that a little bit more interesting, just given that it's, it's Hollywood and you know, it's not cut out exactly what, what you hear, but it's, it'll be, you know, I have some personal stories to share with you there. And then the last 10 years of my career, I've been focusing more on the private equity. So Colony Capital, as was mentioned earlier, is a, is a global investment firm, and they purchased both Miramax and then the company that I'm currently running the operations for, Sonify Solutions. So I'll give you a little bit of insight as to how they tend to value things and, 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 um, and make investments, but, but also just share with you some of the personal learnings that I've had just in terms of being a leader and, and, and go into some detail there. And then there's Q&A. But again, if at any point in time, don't hesitate. Raise your hand. Happy to talk about uh, anything in particular that pertains to you and what you're thinking about these days or any, any, any hot topics. So I grew I'm from Azusa, California. I want to ask, has anybody heard of Azusa or anybody from? Go Cougars, baby! Wow, look at you. That's awesome. All right. Everything from A to Z in the USA, right? One afterwards, for sure. <laughs> awesome. So you were planted there just for me. I, I love it. Um, so I grew up in, a, in Azusa, California. Come from a military family. I'm the oldest of three boys. My, my uncle served in the Korean War in the Navy. My, my, I have an uncle who was a chief master sergeant, retired. And my dad, who had a finance banking career, was very fond of the military, loved espionage and intel. And so right before he hit 40, he joined the reserves and was a chief warrant officer and uh, you know, did his two weeks every year. And so when I was going through high school, I, you know, I was either gonna go to one of the UC schools, but I wanted to serve my country, and it was part of my family heritage to, to consider doing so. So I, I, was, I applied to the service academy, so I was very fortunate, had a few options. But there was a particular movie, my spring of my senior year in 1986, that came out and really inspired me to, to, to join one particular academy. Did anyone Guess which movie that might have been? Top Gun. Top Gun. I was gonna. I know it was, it was Top Gun, and and the irony there is, you know, that's Navy. But I figured if I'm gonna join the military, I'd rather like you know play volleyball and drink beer and, and be able to fly planes. So, not necessarily in that order. So uh, went to the Air Force Academy. I was able to. Also, it was closer to home psychologically. I just felt like I could see my family a little bit easier. I ran track there. I was a pole vaulter for four years. I, um, and then when I got there, though, the, the commitment had changed to 10 years to, to, to be a pilot. And as an 18-year-old, 17-year-old kid, I, I just wasn't really prepared for that. And, and I was more interested in getting in a support mission, support role. So I wanted to get more on the business side of the Air Force. So when I graduated, I, for five years, I had two assignments in the Air Force. One was in Montgomery, Alabama. Anybody from Montgomery? And so uh, I, I was running, I, I was a project manager for, it was the headquarters for all high tech in the Air Force. So all the management information systems, computers, and so I was responsible for overseeing a bunch of uh, development and procurement of, of hardware and software. I did that for three years there. The Air Force was kind enough to sponsor me to get my, my MBA, all paid for full time with all our taxpayers' money, but I, 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 I can tell you, I, I try to, pay back in, in many ways as I could, but I, I did go to Harvard Business School. I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. Um, right, at, right upon graduation, I was gonna go back and teach at the academy um, as a follow-on assignment, but that fell through at the last minute, and I wanted to get back closer to Los Angeles. So I went to um, the Air Force Base in LA, is, is, is right near LAX. I, it was satellite technology that I focused on, and, but nine months later, I was they were downsized in the military. Couldn't believe it was happening so quick. I owed him four more years for, all, for, all, for the MBA. So they were asking, so I raised my hand. I, I got out and I started networking and, and I got to the Walt Disney Company and I'll go into a little bit more of how that happened. I was in a corporate group for almost eight years. Michael Eisner was the CEO. Talk about culture shock, just one to the next. I mean, defense industry to, 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 the, to the Walt Disney Company. But, I, had, I learned a ton, like I'll go into that in a bit. I, I 
went up through the ranks, so to speak, and, and after eight years, I ended up going into an operating role. I wanted to run something. So I went to the coolest job you could ever imagine. I didn't probably appreciate it as much until I've, I look back now, but the Disneyland Resort, uh, three theme parks, uh, or two theme parks, three hotels, and a retail dining and entertainment district called Downtown Disney. And I mean, I could do no wrong in my family's eyes because I'd worked some long hours then. I'd come home, and my wife and my kids were very understanding because they all thought I worked for, you know, for Mickey Mouse. My kids literally thought Mickey Mouse was my boss. And so, you know, they had all kinds of great perks. And I knew if I ever left that company, you know, they, they would never forgive me. And they still sort of, they still wonder why I, I left such a wonderful gig. But anyway, I, I, did, I uh, did that for three years. I was responsible for all the all the revenue, it was like $2 billion. I didn't really know what I was doing at first, but I figured it out, and, and, and I knew that if I increased prices, I could make more money, and so you can blame me for those crazy prices I started back when I was there. Uh, about 15 years into my career at Disney, I, I, I was hitting sort of, I don't know, they, they call midlife crisis at every point in your, in your life nowadays, but I wanted something a little different, and I wanted to be more entrepreneurial, so I hung my own shingle, I left the company, started a consulting firm that worked closely with venture capital f groups and private equity firms, and I did a little bit of that, um, and it reconnected me, or connected me with a company called Co Colony Capital, private equity firm, and the former CFO of Disney was one of the key uh, executives there, so that little past history sort of got me reacquainted. They had just, they, had, they owned Neverland Ranch, if you remember, Anyone remember Neverland Ranch? It's Michael Jackson's former residence. He had already moved away, but they held it as a real estate asset and, um, when, it was, when he was filing for his own for bankruptcy, and so this was several years ago prior to that. Michael Jackson had just passed uh, that earlier that summer, and they, they, they asked me to go and to, to see if we could create a similar concept like Graceland in Memphis for, for, for Elvis. He's leveraging my theme park experience. So went down to Memphis, you know, understood or studied and analyzed all the different operating flows and the pricing and the guest flows and, and then um, went back and we, I put together a whole strategy and operational financial plan. And we were literally going to move Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch from north of Santa Barbara to, to a location in Vegas, the Hilton Las Vegas, which Connie owned at the time, and just put it like right next to it. And, it was a real wonderful concept. And unfortunately, at the end of the day, the, 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 his siblings wanted their own. We weren't able to strike an exclusive sort of right, so this could be the official Neverland Ranch amusement theme park for Michael. So it, it fell through at the end. But what it did for me, it opened up a door, um, and I became one of their operating executives um, as part of Colony. And they were just in the process of buying uh, Miramax from Disney. So, and, I, and we're gonna relaunch the studio, and I'll get into that in a little bit. Then, and then after that relaunch, about three years into it, got sold to be in Media Group. It's a nice little feather in our cap. I mean, it was my first experience, sort of starting a company from the, from the ground up. And then I, I got a chance to turn a broken business model and company around Sonify Solutions. Just a high, high level on Sonify Solutions. It's, that, it's a tech company um, that installs satellite and, and servers in a hotel that carries a, a, a signal to, to each hotel room and, and it distributes um, first run Hollywood movies. So movies that are still in theaters like 30, 45 days out, the only other place you can watch them is either in a hotel or in an airline. So that's sort of their niche and the business model, no one, you know, everyone's bringing their own content with them to hotels no longer buying $17, $18 movies, and so I was brought in to, to help turn that around, and, and I'll talk about that shortly. And I don't know what's next. I, and, and the reason, and I may have spent a little extra time on each one of these, but a couple of key things that I picked up on, first and foremost, I didn't plan for any of this happen this way. It wasn't deliberate, it wasn't a straight line. It wasn't like I'm gonna be in this company, you know, and, and for the next 25 years, you know, those, I learned that you know, all this came about. Not one of these jobs came from an executive search, from, from a job posting. It all came through referrals and, and network and, and building those relationships early, early on. 
And, it, and, it, and you won't believe this, but it started when I was at the Air Force Academy with my professors, my management, co comparable to the business program here, professors who, who took, who took uh, an interest in my, in my future, my career early on, and, and they helped guide me, and you know, they helped pave the way. My ability to go to business school was because of them, my first job, and, and throughout my career, I've always kept in touch, and, and I go back and, and talk to the cadets there as well. So, not too dissimilar from what you're gonna probably experience. Uh, get to be open to the possibilities, the network. And then the other thing also is, you're never gonna be prepared to do any of these kind of jobs, and that shouldn't deter you from attempting to, to, to try, because it's all, it's all on the job training, so to speak. I mean, you figure it out, you have the basic knowledge, and you have it through this curriculum here, and then if you get the MBA, even, even more, but everything here comes down to figuring out how to connect and lead people. And I can't emphasize that enough, because to, to achieve results, you gotta be able to just you know, get a group of people and, and convince them to do something they normally wouldn't do on their own. And, um, and along this route, I had certain stops along the way that, that helped shape my thinking and my approach, and, and I'll share that with you, as, obviously, as well. Any, any questions so far? Comments? So it all started with the, the, the core values and the leadership training at the Air Force. Started the academy, that's the, the bottom, the base of the ramp. Integrity first, service before self, excellence in all we do. And, and that carried on right into my first assignment in Montgomery, Alabama. And, and one of the lessons I picked up on was to be really true to, to yourself and, and, and develop your own style of leadership. Because the hardest thing I had that I, I grappled with a little bit, excuse me, as a 22-year-old lieutenant, you're having to lead and, and, and you know, 20, 30-year seniors, uh, people that are senior to you that really know what they're doing. You really don't have a clue what's going on yet. And, and by forma formal, formally, they're supposed to salute you and, and, and address you by sir or ma'am. And, 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 and that's how you approach it. But I found that you know, to really get more out of that exchange, I needed to really get to know my people and, and really find a way to connect with them. And, and that's just even understanding what their family backgrounds are and, and, and that personal touch makes a huge difference. Um, and then the other piece, when you're, you're, you're scoping out the work, it's really easy just to delegate and just uh, you know, just hand things off. I always found it very helpful to just pitch in, and if there was five things to do, I, I would make sure I left one of those for myself. And then when they, when, when, and this applies in business in every organization, if, if, if they see that you're right there in the thick of it all, figuring it out with them, I know it sounds like the basic simple things, but you'd be amazed at how much that does not happen. So if you just do some of that, it, you're building that trust and earning that credibility, and it's, you, you become more authentic to, to how they see you and, and as a leader. So that was the backbone for me was this Air Force experience and um, as I'm sure you're, you're having that here as well. The, um, it's a nice bright slide with Mickey. Um, I get the question a lot, like how did that happen? Like defense, fighter pilot or fighter jets and technology to you know, the happiest place on earth, or the, the corporate office at, Walt Dis, at the Walt Disney Company. Um, and that happened in a very practical way. It happened because I got an MBA. It helped me sort of shift industries and, and shift paths. And, and so it was a very practical tool. And so I, I encourage all of you, if you're thinking about whether you may get an MBA or not, I know some of you are in the process of getting one, maybe that was one of your uh, objectives. It definitely helps. And, um, and because of that MBA, I was able to act, literally pick up the phone and just call my former colleagues that I had just graduated with about a year earlier and um, got into the organization, interviewed, and I ended up in this strategic planning group, which was a, an in-house mix of consultants and investment bankers that, that worked under, under Michael Eisner. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. And, and in 1998, when I joined Disney, Eisner had taken a company that was nearly bankrupt back in 1985. Most people don't even know that the Walt Disney Company almost failed to exist because it was just being run poorly. And, 
and, and he took it over. It was about a couple billion dollars of revenue. By the time I joined, it was I think like 25 to 30 billion. And there was just tremendous growth. Um, the market capitalization at that time, which may not seem like a lot now, was 55 billion. But it was, and it was growing like 25% a year over year clip, which was just incredible. Um, so when I got there, it was like the Wild West. Like people are just spending money left and right, just, you know, capital expenditures here and there. You had consumer products, the film business, theme parks. So our group was sort of like the watchdog. And it was an interesting dynamic because we had to work with our individual business units and try to make sure that they weren't spending money too quickly and they had sound assumptions and their financial plans made sense because we wanted to make sure that that capital was being allocated appropriately for shareholders. So it was, it, it, there was a lot of contentious kind of discussions and, and, and I had a boss, if you can believe this, I had a boss that I worked for at the time. And I had just come from a military background and he was, um, hey Tommy, when you go down to the business units, just like, it's rule with an iron fist. You go down there, be quick, in and out. You, you got Michael Eisner's backing. You just, you know, here are the assumptions and trust us, execute, move on. I didn't know any other way than to not do it that way. Uh, but I, I, you know, and I had, a, I, had a, I had a group of people from finance, operations, the Walt Disney Imagineering, that's the creative arm that built all the parks. So all these different people had different objectives and all their incentives were not even aligned properly. So to, to go in that sort of forceful kind of way was just not gonna work. So at the end of the day, the only answer typically is to compromise. And you have to do a little give and take. The only way you get there is to have a, a more personal, collaborative approach to leading. And so that's what I did. And, 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 it, and it worked for me. You know, some of my other colleagues, you know, they, they did something similar, others more top down. And, and, and for this particular boss of mine, he, didn't, he wasn't there for much longer, uh, which was good for me because I was able to sort of flourish in my own sort of approach. Um, and one of the barometers that I typically use is, you know, after a, a day of like battling it out, you know, uh, at, uh, in, in the boardroom or, you know, doing the analysis, betting assumptions like you all are doing, I'm sure, in all your different classes, if I could actually go out and have a cup of coffee or a beer or a drink with the same folks afterwards and we could talk about family and what's going on in the sports world, I mean, and that's what I was, then that, I knew that I struck, I striked a really good balance, and, and it just makes, it makes, you know, everyone's trying to earn their keep, right, of putting groceries on the table, and everyone wants to really enjoy what they're doing day to day, and I, I just found that to be my style and approach that worked, and so, um, I do have one, one, one story I'd like to share with you all, uh, when I was there, and it's, it, 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 it points to the littlest things actually, when you least expect it, matter. So one of my side duty, side jobs, or not side jobs, but our, the chief strategy officer of our group, we were like 30 of us, and I focused primarily on parks and resorts. Every, every month he wanted someone from the group to talk about an issue or a topic within their industry that was relevant to, to, to their business, to get a little collaborative thinking and engagement with our other colleagues. But it was sort of an internal group discussion. So he approached me once and said, hey, I saw this documentary call uh, on Coney Island, on PBS. Hey, Tommy, you should, you know, if, when you're up next, why don't you screen that for the group? I think it, it, it spurs some good dialogue. So I said, all right. So, so I went to go find it at a Blockbuster. You know, many of you may not even remember Blockbuster, but it's an old V8, and it was already an old VHS, and, and, and so I, I watched it at home. And it was, it was boring as heck. I mean, it had some good messages, but it basically talked about early 1900s. Coney was like the most visited attraction in all the US. Everyone went there. By 1960s and 70s and so forth, it just became this rundown former self, uh, for, you know, rundown park. And, and, and it, you know, because people moved away from the city to, to suburbia and, and consumer taste shifted. So, Peter, my boss, like, I, you know, maybe this happens to our theme parks. Maybe there's some lessons we can learn. So, but it, it was boring. I thought of, of a way to, to, to spice it up without really telling anybody. So there was a movie, I'm not sure, I, I'm really, I mean, if anyone knows this, I want to be impressed, but it's, it's a classic cult, I'll say it's a cult classic, maybe I think it is, 
called The Warriors. Have you ever seen it? If, if you have, you should, yeah. And, and yeah, Warriors come out to play. Shaq, you know, the Can You Dig It when they won a couple of their championships, lifted a line from that movie. But here's the crazy thing. So if some of you who've watched it know, at the end, basically all these gangs come together in Central Park and for a truce, and then one gang gets blamed for shooting another gang's leader, and, and then that gang's called the Warriors that gets blamed, and they didn't really do it. But then the movie premises, they're, they have to go overnight back to Coney, their home base, while all, all these other gangs are coming after them. The end of that movie is a five-minute scene where it shows Coney Island in the backdrop and the, and the Ferris wheel, and so I took that five minutes. You know, I'm in, I'm in a creative company, right? So what's the, what's the big deal? So I, I spliced it in the end of that documentary. The next day, we have our present, I, you know, I'm waiting for Peter, my boss, to show up. Everyone's, and I bring in hot candy and popcorn to really make it all festive, like, you know, immersive experience, I'm trying to make a good impression, right? My early time at Disney. Then he comes over and he has somebody with him, and it's Bob Iger. Bob Iger, who's the CEO of Disney for the last 10 plus years. He was the president and COO then. He had just become our COO, and first time I meet him, and I'm like mortified. What's he gonna think? Like, what, I'm a, some Yahoo who just like, you know, cuts up IP and whatever. So, uh, so Peter comes up to me and goes, "Hey, you know, we have. I was having lunch with Bob, and I told him you're having this presentation. You know, he's from Brooklyn, and he said, oh, I used to go to Coney Island as a kid. I said, well, why don't you come down? Tommy has a great presentation to share. And so here I am. I'm like, and then meanwhile, I had, you know, I told the only person I told was my immediate boss. Who, who was, you know, who, who had seen the movie and said, oh, that's cool, you should do that, that's great. At this point, he's not even making eye contact with me. Like, I have no, so we show, I'm showing, I'm showing the, the documentary, and then I'm sweating bullets, it finally gets to that point in the end of the movie, it goes to that part of it, shows the warrior, the last scene, and I see a bunch of, like, stare, you know, blank faces, like, what is this? Like, I don't understand, and, and it ends, and then there's, like, silence, and I'm like, this is it, I, my career's done. And then, and then I, I look at, and I see Bob, Bob Iger turn his head towards me and he, he, he actually smiles. He goes, Tommy, you know, that's one of my favorite movies. I've, the Warriors, where'd you find that? I get it, you know? And then of, of course, then everybody else starts to chime in and ah, it's, 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 I've seen it too. And so, so <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, and the reason I mention this, because for the next eight years, I kid you not, Bob Iger knew who I was, knew how many kids I had, would always you know, call me out it, right in the middle of the, uh, you know, of the grounds of the company and help, help pave my next phase of my career when I was at Disney. And, and uh, I was just a known quantity. So uh, my only message is that you, you just never know. You know put, you, put your passion into whatever you do, even if it's not your day to day, because you'll be surprised that you know, this, maybe not the CEO, but someone's going to notice something that's going to strike something in, in them, and that's it's going to reflect on on you as a person, and and uh, it'll it might just pay off. So, the little things do do matter. Any any uh, questions? Let's see. All right. So, if we don't have time. So the next the next stage. After eight, so when Bob became, he became CEO eventually, and I was fortunate because I wanted to get an operating role, and he and others helped pave the way for me to go to Disneyland and help run these, these wonderful, wonderful assets. Um, however, the culture at Disneyland is different as it was from military to the corporate. You know, at the corporate office, everyone went by first name. You had your little name tag. and. And there was not too many formalities, not much of a chain of command. I mean, I was 24 years old. I'm, you know, I'm like having conversations with the CEO, right? That's that's different. It was, uh, and here, I'm sort of parachuting in from a corporate office because I, I have, I'm, I'm, I'm given this opportunity. But most of the people I worked with were folks that worked their way up through, you know, sweeping the parks, working the attractions, and. So even though I knew some of them and, and, and they respected me, if at least I thought, you know, I, I had built good relationships with them, I had something to prove, right? That it, was that really genuine? Was that the real deal? Am I just sort of doing this for another little stop along the way? And so Walt Disney had a program. He believed that every executive needed to walk in the shoes of a frontline employee. Because you can't make decisions and you can't lead unless you know exactly what everyone's doing. 
down, and, and, and that was just his philosophy. So I had to go through in costume, what they called in costume training. So I put on, and, and no one, it was like undercover boss before undercover boss, seriously. And, and no one knew, as a matter of fact, anyway, I I'll, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But so, so I had to rotate in over a four or five week period uh, into different roles. I was like the conductor of the train one day, you know, and people thought that, I, you know, they didn't know I was coming, I was from the corporate office or within Disneyland, and so I was getting trained by somebody, and, and I do that, and then, um, you know, Space Mountain, I did some, you know, food and beverage, but then I finally landed in the custodial group, the, the, all the folks who were the whites, and, and Walt's pride in keeping that park pristine and clean was his number one objective, number one priority, and so you've all, if, you, if you've ever been there, you know what I'm talking about, right? The bathrooms, the walkways, everything. And so it was my last sort of rotation, and, and again, they didn't know who I was. I was just a guy who applied and got the job. And so I get paired up with a gentleman named Danny, who's gonna be my trainer. He's like in his early 20s, going to part-time college, and we, you know, he starts showing me the ropes, and gosh, there's a method to everything, like the way you sweep, you know, the way you empty the waste baskets, and then you're doing it behind sort of behind the scenes. Even though you're there, no one can really see you. It's a really strange, it's, it's very interesting how they do it. And um, so then we took a break one day. We're, we're, we're behind what they call the back of house, gathered with a few other custodial folks. Uh, and, uh, and we're just sort of shooting the breeze. And then out comes through the, loud, through the walkie-talkie is code 72. Like, and I don't know what the heck that means, but everyone starts looking at each other and some of them smile. And, and then Danny, my trainer, looks to me and goes, hey, you know, let's, let's go do this one. You're going you're gonna to need to figure this one out at some point. I go, all right. So I figured some, you know, some spill in the walkway, and you got to take care of it and before someone slips and falls. So we start walking. I don't ask any questions. And we're walking towards Main Street, towards the restrooms. So now I know, okay, we're going to the restrooms. Just empty the waste basket or paper towels. So we get in there, and there's a lockbox. And he opens it up, and he... And he, and he <laughs> And he hands me these like forceps, like this instrument. And I'm like, what is this? And he goes, no, you just go to stall three and you'll figure it out. And he goes, and he goes, you know what a code 72 is? And I go, no, it's well, it's it's code for unbreakable. You just just go there and 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 you'll you'll figure it out. So I mean, I went there, needless to say, that tool definitely helped unclog the toilet and, and mission accomplished, right? I mean, I never thought for the life of me that I would be doing that sort of job after getting an MBA, after being rubbing elbows with Michael Eisner, you know, uh, and Bob Iger, and, and, and all the wonderful things that I'd done up to that point, and, and, and unbelievable, right? So, and I, it's a little dramatic for effect because what it taught me was you got to, you know, if you don't know what everyone is actually doing, the frontline employee, it's hard to be that leader and make decisions. I mean, Shortly thereafter, I'm, we're negotiating union rates for the custodial group, and you better believe that I had a much deeper appreciation for what they did to keep that part clean and everything smooth. Um, and then clearly after a couple of days and I'm walking the park and they realized who I was and what I actually did, I didn't, I mean, I could have probably just backed out, but they had tremendous respect and, and I, my credibility just took another level up. And so, Again, just when, in whatever role you have in your job when you leave here and when you get in a position of leadership, just remember the little guys, the little, you know, in, in every part of that organization has a, a, a role, and, in, and the more you understand what they do, the better off you'll be. So after theme parks, operating role I had at Disneyland, you know, my kids were getting a little older, um, eight and nine. I've, I don't know if I mentioned I have three. I have my son here, and who's a sophomore, and then I have a year, uh, 15-year-old sophomore in high school, and my daughter is in eighth grade. And You know, I, I was liked sort of Southern California. We live, we live in Manhattan Beach, just south of LAX. Uh, my family's nearby, and I, I just felt like I wanted to sort of make sure I didn't have to move ever again. And, and so at Disney, it looked like I, may, I would have had to relocate. My, I had a, you know, my, my priority was my family, and I really wanted to strike that balance of being close to them. And, and I was itching to do something more entrepreneurial. So I, I decided after 15 years, it was time for me to try something different. 
and I, and I started my own consulting practice, as I mentioned earlier, and, and that got me connected with, with, um, with Colony Capital, and, and then I was brought in as the, the second employee. So basically, D Disney, so the Weinstein brothers who started Miramax, they were acquired by Disney back, I think, in 1990. By 2005, they had all these, I mean, this library, you can just see for yourself. I mean, you probably recognize some of these movies, Pulp Fiction and, and uh, you know, Spy Kids, Kill, you know, Good Will Hunting, 68, you know, all these great picture Academy Award nominations, bunch of money, unbelievable, pound for pound, one of the best libraries in, in all of Hollywood. Um, but they, they, they butted heads with, 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 with leadership at Disney, so they, they got bought out. They basically left in 2005, formed the, the, the Weinstein Company, and um, then Disney just had these assets, and they didn't do anything with them. They just sort of they sat in the shelf collecting dust, and so at this, they, they, uh, so they, brought, they brought me in along with my colleague, it was the CEO, and we went ahead and bid you know, the, the, the colony bid on the, uh, on, the, on, on the company, on the Miramax Film Library. We won the bid because we had a higher bid. Uh, I think it was like $650 million versus, I don't know, everyone else was at least $100 million lower or, or, or more than that. And one of the things, the reason for that was everyone who was bidding uh, alongside us were, were true Hollywood sort of investors, they came from the industry. Although I was in entertainment, I, I, you know, I was parks and resorts, and the other people that I was with, my, Mike Lang, who was our CEO, had a similar background. And so they all didn't see like a franchise tentpole film that they could really like build on. They, they, they were thinking red carpet, they were thinking star power. There, were, there weren't any development projects associated with the library at the, at the moment or any big name people. And so it was just a library for them that they had to figure out how to monetize. For us, that's exactly what we thought too, is a library to monetize. But we were really into the business analytics discipline at that point in time. We noticed that films like Pulp Fiction hadn't even been released on Blu-ray. And none of these films were even digitized yet to be uh, sold on Netflix or, or Hulu at the time. So we were doing a lot more math and, and we figured out there's more value than they're thinking. So we, we, we saw value where they didn't. And then the second reason was a lot of these films were the big breakthrough hits for some of the biggest names in Hollywood, like Ben Affleck and Matt Damon with Good Will Hunting, you know, Quentin Tarantino with, his, with Pulp Fiction, you know, Kevin, Kevin Smith, Clerks, and, and Robert Rodriguez, and you know, the, list, the list goes on. Um, so I had a sense that if we picked up the phone and talked to this talent, and, and said, hey, you know, we're gonna re-release your titles, anniversary editions, you mind doing some interviews and some bonus footage, and I, we saw a whole cycle of that opportunity that no one else saw. So uh, that was a big part of why we were able to win that bid and had a premium to everyone else. Um, so then, you know, and, and so my responsibility was to build the organization from the two of us to about 150 plus people, including the infrastructure so the rights management is the lifeblood of this library business. It's knowing where you can get a movie, sell, sell it internationally, or sell it to pay television or digitally, and, and, no, and make sure you're not sort of, you're not cannibalizing where it's already been sold and it's all this, all, all this math, so you need all this technology. But you need the licensing agreements. So, so when, when the deal got con, uh, finished, we were literally handed, remember this is all intellectual property, there's no, no more people at Miramax, the wine scenes were gone, $650 million, and they hand us two thumb drives. And in those thumb drives were like some of the rights where movies had been sold and not sold, and, and I'm thinking, well, where the heck are, I mean, these are like 800 movies. And then we realized, and I think this is what everyone else who bid with us did, but they were like, it's too much work, too much risk. We found out that all these licensing agreements, literally, this is just a picture of one warehouse, we're in 10 different warehouses in 30,000 boxes. I mean, the Weinsteins did not, were not organized whatsoever. They didn't digitize anything. Everything was scattered everywhere with former employee records. And, and so literally my first six months and that first month, immediately I had to get, and again, nothing I was ever prepared to do, but like lease six semi trucks, because these were all back east, go through all these boxes, load them up, transport them, find a warehouse in LA, 
climate controlled, and literally get a bunch of Xerox machines, get a cadre of people, and start just blocking and tackling. And so, again, you know, 30,000 boxes, it might have been a little plus or minus a couple thousand, but the point here is, you know, sometimes to find value, you have to look where no one else is willing or able to look, and no one was willing to go through this effort and grind it out. And, and, and I'm, I'm certain that many of you, you're gonna have your 30,000 box story at some point in your career, and just know that it, it, you know, you, you'll get through it, and, and that's sort of what you want, because that means that no one else figured it out. So, yeah, and, the, and, the, and so the, the benefit here, though, which is pretty cool, so Rob Lowe and Will Smith were two investors in Miramax, there was a few others, and they were just jonesing to, to get some new projects, and we didn't think there were any. Part of our uncovering of all this, we found like 200 development projects that we still had the rights to that, that just needed to be finished. So they were very happy, the board was happy, and you know, it was a win-win, so. So that was Miramax. Any questions so far? All right, so then I, this is the last stop in, in Tommy's little journey. Um, if I'm invited to come back again, I, I might be able to add to it a little bit more. No. Uh, the Miramax to Sonify Solutions. So where Miramax was a ground up, we, we built an organization from scratch. So we knew how to, what talent we needed, when we needed it, and we, we shaped our own culture organically. We just, and we wanted one of innovation and risk taking and all that and, 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 and you know, um, work hard, play hard kind of concept and, and so that was wonderful. This company had been around for 30 years and it was a turnaround. It was, it was a company that went bankrupt, had 600 existing people, they were demoralized, they were beaten down. So the background on this company, effectively, they, they, they deliver television channels, direct TV channels programming to hotels. As I mentioned earlier, first run Hollywood movies. Again, these are before they get into the home entertainment window. And then this last piece, and, it, and we, so we have the licenses with all the major studios. Then this last piece was a service and support organization that was like 250 technicians across the country. No one knew anything about them. All they knew that was that they fixed our interactive televisions, the satellite dish that delivered the signal, the server that housed that signal, distributed through the coax into each and every TV. That was sort of our ecosystem of this interactive television technology platform. And they just always were there. They were across the country, there were our own employees in their own vans, and they were solid technicians. They knew how to fix and we found out they knew how to fix more than just that. So, but, it, but the people there had been in silos their whole, I mean, for, that were existing. Prior management didn't foster any kind of communication. They were based out of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, which is where I was just these past few days. Um, and they just, they, there was, if they took, they, there was no incentive but just to do the same thing over and over because if you did something different, you might, be, you might get punished or you weren't gonna get recognized, that's for sure. So we had a big challenge as a leadership team to try to, how do we change that culture? How do we change manage? So we had to sort of hit, get a, big, a, a, a quick win first and then we could tackle the, the, the issue. So the first thing we did was, okay, everyone's bringing their own content to, 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 host, to hotels. Uh, you can't, it, that's a hard thing to counteract. I mean, that's just gonna continue to happen. So how about we develop a casting technology? So we partnered with Google. We used the Chromecast. We, we integrated some special software uh, so, so folks can come into their hotel room and pair their device with, because you still, you can't carry a 42 inch on an airplane with you, right? So you're, you're, you're gonna be better off watching a bigger screen. And then we just charged the hotel a nominal fee. So it became more of a business to business kind of economic model at least for now, and not relying on consumers hoping that they would buy a movie. Then once they're actually watching their own content on that TV, then there's a good chance that they may just go ahead and even, maybe even purchase one of our movies. So, so all of a sudden, everybody was like, oh my gosh, we can do something different. You know, the engineering team. And then we looked at the next thing we saw and the vision we had was the service organization was a $20 million cost center. 
So the, so the textbook answer at this point, and what we, you know, why not and save 20 million, cut, them, cut that group loose, and you, you realize that savings overnight, we outsource. Why do you need your own technicians? Well, given a little bit, I mean, I, my background, understanding that you got to be in the front line employee shoes. And I mean, there's something, I mean, the fact that no one really knows exactly what they do. So I went and, and started talking and traveled the country, talking to some of these folks. These were 25, 20 plus year veterans. They were the most loyal, committed employees in this whole company. They were actually the ambassadors of Sonify, or it was called LodgeNet prior, when, when times were tough. I found out that all the GMs, all the directors of engineering, love these guys. And, 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 and then I started discovering that they weren't just fixing our stuff. The, the, they were so trusted that when the HVAC system went down, or the Wi-Fi went down, or there was an issue with a the thermostat, guess what? They just asked them to do it. And over time, some of them on their own were somewhat entrepreneurial. They got certified in this stuff, and here we are sitting on a very highly trained uh, base of people. So I decided, and I proposed, and it took a little, it was a bit challenging, because again, the near term benefit, get the money. I saw, uh, you know, we saw a bunch of you know, great employees great, who had families, who had committed their whole lives to this organization. To, how about we build a business instead? We start charging for these services, and we get AT&T, we go to Honeywell, we go to Asa Abloy, which is a company that uh, installs those digital door locks, and we strike arrangements with them to use our guys because they're going into a hotel. They, it, our incremental cost is marginal. They can repair all these things while they're there, and they know how to do it. And there's only one, instead of managing a bunch of subcontractors across the country, they just call one number, that's us, and we project administer everything. I, it's easier said than done, but we started doing a little of these pilot programs, little by little, we empowered the employees, we put the right ones in leadership positions, and over two years, we went from a cost center to a profit center, and the vision is to be this $100 million standalone entity, and, I, and it's, the timing is interesting because we had our first sort of, because all these folks are all over, the, all over the, the US, we brought all the field directors and all the lead technicians, these, this sort of the, the leadership group, about 25 people, we brought them to Sioux Falls where the operations is. And it was just amazing to see how far they've come and how proud they are of what they've done. And they, this is what they've been wanting to do for years, but they were never listened to. They never had a voice. So again, you, you, you find, you give your employees a voice and you'd be amazed. And sometimes that textbook solution always challenged that status quo because for different reasons. Financially, this made a lot more sense. We have a $100 million business that someday it's gonna be carved out and it's gonna be probably sold off and it's gonna be on its own. But also, it, 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 we, 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 um, we, we, we extended the livelihood of a lot of these individuals and, and we hired more people and it was just a really good, feel good um, strategy that, that worked out in the end. And we're about to wrap it up. Um, and I don't, you know, I mean, these are just some of the lessons. I mean, you all, you all know this, but sometimes it's easy. It, it might help to just dimensionalize it as we talked about. I mean, just be open to the possibilities. I mean, I can't emphasize enough, and it starts here at Notre Dame with your professors, with your colleagues. Build and nurture those relationships. I kid you not. And, it, and, and for some, it's, it's, it may not be an, like an easy thing if you're not that extroverted type of person, but you don't need to be. It's just keep it in touch, you know, sharing experiences, making a phone call and email every so often, you'd be amazed and make sure that that goes both ways too. I mean, there'll be people coming to you as I've been able to do with a lot of the cadets and I welcome, if any of you are ever in the LA area, I'm happy to sit down and, and if I can provide any perspective or guidance or, or help facilitate anything, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, the little things do matter as I share that, that that Warriors movie experience. Hopefully if I see it again, you'll, some of you may have may go watch that and it's a pretty cool film. Um, and leadership, I mean, I mean listen and, and build trust and credibility. I mean, just the ideas are always in front of you, honestly, and you don't have to be an expert in, in, in anything 
You just have to be willing to, to learn and to trust those who know what they're doing and empower them. So, and by the way, it's be, don't conform to what people think or your organization thinks you have to lead a certain way. Just be yourself and, and believe in me. I mean, going through that journey of mine, I tell you all the times I went to my, my poor wife and said, hey, I think I may have made a mistake. Did I do the right thing? You, you'll, you'll second guess yourself here and there, but you know, your faith and your trust in, what, in who you are and just continue to believe in yourself is, um, is key. So at this point, I think they said 11.30, went over a few minutes. We can open it up to questions um, or not. Absolutely. That's all I care. Home team versus fourth? Yes, of course. I just want to make sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even if, by the way, even if Air Force was here playing Notre Dame, which I know they did before at some point, I'd be rooting for Notre Dame. So how's that? All right. So I had a question. So you mentioned that mentorship is important to you. Yeah. This is a personal thing, but also kind of giving back sort of way. As a CEO of a company, how do you find time to place your priorities for something like this? Because it's a Friday, it's a work day, and then you're spending time with the peers there. Uh, that's a great question, Ben. Uh, first of all, I mean, I, I enjoy I enjoy doing this. I love connecting with people. Um, you know, I, you just you, you just find time to do it. And, and you know, I I also have three kids that I want to set a good example for. And and you know, they all know where I'm at. I mean, my son actually I found out today that uh, yesterday he's going to be brought up to varsity to play football. He's a sophomore in high school. That's a big deal. And you know, he knows I'm not going to be there. And and but but he knows that I'm you know, doing something good, and, 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 and um, I just, you know, you just, you make it a priority, Ben. You just make it a priority, and, and you know, and I, I kid you not, like 20 years ago when I started doing some of this at the Academy, like some of the people that I've, that I've collaborated with on the outside, there's some other initiatives that I'm, I'm, I'm also been working on, uh, and uh, our folks that used to work for me, and, and, and I've helped place people in other positions, so it's just a small world, and, and I just believe in, in just that giving back and, 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 and helping and, and your career just will can flourish as a result. Um, but yeah, now making, making, making it a priority is key, Ben, and, and I just enjoy doing this. And, and you know, I'll be home on Sunday and have nice stories to share with them. I mean, I mean, they're all jealous. They wish they could be here, actually. So, but they all have their other scheduled activities, so. You're welcome, Ben, yeah. Good morning. I'm sorry, go ahead. I apologize. Oh, here we go. Um, you talked about building and nurturing relationships. How exactly did you go about doing that throughout your career? Yeah, no, great question. Um, you have to be a little proactive. I mean, I, I just ask a lot of questions. And, and when I, it started right, like I said, at an undergrad, I didn't know what major. I was like a sophomore at the Air Force Academy. I remember beginning my junior year, we had to declare. And I, and I just didn't you know, know what, if I wanted to major in engineering or, or, or management. And, and I just ran into a couple of professors in the management department. And I just connected with them. And, and, and I established a dialogue with them. And, and that's how it started. I mean, it's, and then when I got in the workplace, I, uh, you know, I just, would, would, would accept, you know, people would come to me or email me, I'd meet with them for coffee. Or when, I, when I first um, went from the military to Disney, I, little, I did get a little scientific about it. I, I got like all the alumni from Harvard Business School and the Air Force Academy and, you know, I, I knew some of them and then I'd start with them and then I, you know, I was interested in a couple of different areas like entertainment and I was looking at some consulting opportunities with some of those firms. And then I would just do, you know, I would email them. Um, I would keep track of that. I, I would ask for informational interviews. That's what you all have a, a huge benefit of doing, especially with your alumni network, is, is setting up informational interviews. I mean, and, and, and particularly folks that are maybe, I mean, I'm not going to say that, that those that have just entered the private industry are going to be less or more willing to meet with you. They all will. But those in the, like, 10 to 12 years removed, 
there comes a time when if, if you're the right kind of person, you want to you mentor or, or, and, and you have this desire to. So, so it's a really easy, non-threatening way. It's just, hey, I, I'm interested in this kind of career field. I have a few questions. Is it possible for, for us to meet or do a phone call or I can grab coffee before work? And, so it's, it's, and then it just builds on itself. Open, John. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I love your story. I love hearing about this. I think it's unique. But a lot of times, just hear you should do this, do that. Just kind of hear your story and see what helps. Cool. Um, one question I had is you have any regrets, things you do differently? Um, you know, no, no regrets to be. I mean, I'm just trying to make sure I'm giving you an honest, honest answer. I, I, I really don't because when I look back, I, I, I value you know, the, the, the friendships I've made along the way and, and you know, the relationships. And, and as a result of that kind of journey that I had, I've been able to do that. You know, I was in, you know, in six or seven different, you know, jobs and five or six different industries. And, and it just made me a more, a better, well-rounded sort of perspective. So that, that's, that's been enjoyable. Um, Maybe the only, you know, could I have taken a little bit more risk a little bit earlier on? I mean, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now in this private equity space, perhaps, but I would have had the benefit of having that foundation and big company experience and, and truly navigating through big company cultures that's made me a better leader today, and even in these, in these kind of roles where I have to sort of get down and dirty and, and, and really relate to people. So, um, no, and then one other, one other, you know, I, I think you may have picked up on it as well. Like family is is a big thing, and a lot, of, a lot of, a lot of concern is sometimes over how how can I balance work and family, and I didn't really bring that up, but it, but it gets asked every so often, and that's a deliberate decision that you, that you you need to make, but it's doable. It really is. I mean, I've been able to balance my career and, and my family. I've gone to all my kids. You know, games. I've been able to coach them in youth sports, and gone to my daughter's recitals. And but you have to be committed. Like one of the things that I decided to do, I was going to sort of do a little bit more base camping in the Southern California area. So I never really considered other job opportunities uh, elsewhere. My family. I'm the oldest of three. My my parents are in their 80s. I also wanted to be close to them. And so you have to sort of make a few of those kind of put some parameters. Um, but um, but that's the only thing I would offer up. It, 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 you, you can strike that balance. I mean, it's important to do so, in my opinion. That's what life's all about. And, uh, and so, yeah, thanks for the question. Hello, uh, thanks Hi. for coming. I'm Ruchi from the One Year MBA program. And uh, thanks for enlightening us with an amazing career trajectory. Um, I wanted to know, Every time you switched from military to Walt Disney, Walt Disney to Miramax, Miramax to Sonify, what was that one thing that made you switch? Was it out of satisfaction and gratification from the previous industry that I've been there, done that, I've squeezed everything out of what I could, I'm totally satisfied, and now I want to explore new arenas, or was it out of dissatisfaction? Uh, or a quest or a thirst to learn something more? Uh, so. that's a great question. Man. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a chicken and the egg because the, my, my decisions at some points were a combination of just opportunities that sort of presented themselves. But, but it, you know, when I think, about, I think about Disney and the corporate office, the, the Disneyland, I, I, I'm one who, wanted, who, who likes variety as well. And, and I, I, I like to make an impact. Um, and, and at some point, it's that diminishing marginal kind of return. And, and, but it's not something you analyze. It's just something that you sort of start to, to feel and, and, and the stars sort of align. And so it wasn't necessarily, dis, it was not dissatisfaction, it was just more Gosh, I, 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 there's so many other things to go do and figure out, and, and, and knowing my nature, 
I, I, if I stuck around for too much longer, maybe I would get dissatisfied. And so a lot of it was just opportunity presented itself. I was ready for a new challenge. And I was excited to just try something new, to be honest. And you know, it's funny. My, I, maybe it could have been my upbringing. My father, who was, like I said, he was in the reserves, but he was a banker. He, I mean, he had been a fireman. He had been an actor. He had been, I mean, he, yeah, not an actor like in TV. Or, he studied drama and really did some plays. And um, he was uh, traded commodities in New York and then was a stock. So, you know, he, he was always moving around and, and trying new things. And so I think that sort of, I, I got a little bit of that. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah. And, and there's, you know, there, there is a little bit, I learned this in this organizational behavior class at, in, in, at, at Air Force. And it's interesting because, sort of to address your question too, whenever you approach a company, there's a certain set of norms, rules, and culture, right? You had nothing to do to create it. It's already, already in place. You're your own person. You, you, you know, it's like if, you're, if you have a scale, and, and these are the norms and the rules and the, and the, that you have to sort of conform to, as long as what you're trying to get out of that opportunity, it could be in some cases, it's, it's the, the excitement, that industry, the job itself. And for some, it's, it's compensation, it's life work balance. As long as those things on this side of the scale or whatever side you're looking at outweighs you know, what the organization is requiring of you or, 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 or how you're conforming, then, then, then that's a good barometer that things are healthy, things are good, you're satisfied. And I always try to force myself to look at that every so often. The minute it starts to tip the other way, then there's something, then you need to reassess what, what's important to you and what's, what isn't. And, and then that sometimes can help you understand whether it's maybe it's time to try something new or try something different if that makes any sense. I just wanted to share that with you. Every, yeah, Ben. Uh, so, are we good? I'm good at the mic. I don't need the mic. Guys. No, he's. Uh, he's uh, so, I have a question. So, yeah. You saw that picture of the 30,000 boxes there. Yep. I mean, like, my heart sank, and that's a crisis. What, what was your strategic framework for approaching that situation, and how did you manage that crisis and, and come out productive on the other side? Great, great, Ben. So, what I ended up doing, I was shocked because. It's like, oh my gosh, like first of all, we just assumed everything was gonna be handed on a silver platter with a, like a ribbon tied around it, because it's Disney. Like, someone just paid a bunch of hundreds of millions of dollars, right? I'm like, really? But then I found out like Hollywood is just like behind the scenes, the goalposts, no pun intended, but they're always moving. There are never any rules. There are rules for one second, all of a sudden, so like every contract in Hollywood, like, and that came from the military, and, and, and then in theme parks, it's a bit more of a real estate kind of environment where you know, you, you have agreements, there's like lease agreements and so forth, and it's pretty ironclad. And, and it's so, it's always moving. Yeah. So uh, with, yeah, I, I, was, I was sort of like, you know, like, oh my gosh, this is, this is, this is crazy, how, how, do I, how do I approach this? So the first thing I did was I went to Disney and I found the guy who sort of runs that post-production division. And I went to him, <laughs> I took him to lunch, and I said, hey, dude, can you just like, how would you approach this? Like, because he was responsible for a little bit of, you know, because he, he oversaw the Miramax library too, along with Pixar and Marvel and everything else. And these are all the assets, including these, you know, the boxes and there were props as well, like a bunch of props, movie props. And so I, I just asked him, you know, what do you, how would you approach it? And, and he gave me some suggestions and advice. And it was just, we, we, you know, I just developed a work plan and you know, I estimated just how many, you know, first I had to find, I, I needed to consolidate it all and bring it to one location and I just sort of mapped it out and figured out the, you know, how many trucks we needed, I mean, as basic as that. And then uh, we, you know, I, I hired some good people. That was, that's the other thing too. You need to find good experts. Don't be ashamed or, 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 or bashful, you know, it's okay, like that was another key lesson that I, I learned is find the people to really help with a skill set that you don't have. And I, and I found those people in, in industry and, uh, and I brought them together and we just tackled it together. And, you know, and, and not to sort of make it too overwhelming, you know, we gave ourselves sort of a timeline that was achievable. It wasn't like, oh my gosh, you have to get this done all overnight. 
and little by little, and then we built momentum by reporting out on, okay, we just got through a percentage of, of, of these. By the way, here's a percentage of those are development projects that we never realized we had. And here are all the rights for all the, you know, the, you know, the comedies, the, the, the dramas, and so forth, and we just figured it out. Yeah, you're welcome. You can keep going, it's fine, yeah, great. Please. Oh, thank you. Hi, um, it's a beautiful day today, so welcome. Thank you. Um, my question to you is, being a budding business student, what are the skills that you're looking in applicants entering the entertainment industry? Or what are words of wisdom? I think you kind of touched on it a little bit, but going into more detail. Yeah. I mean, I know some of this seems like it's so obvious, but um, I mean, first and foremost, coming from a great institution like Notre Dame and 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 the curriculum here, I mean, that's gonna that's gonna speak and stand for itself. Uh, you know, uh, pointing because listen, I, I I when I was at Disney, one of my side jobs, we recruited for this corporate group. And I didn't make up the rules. I mean, the guy who ran it w w went to Harvard and he wanted just to recruit from, 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 the, from the Ivy Leagues for this particular type of job. I think they've branched out, fortunately, since then. But they, you know, they, you know, a lot of the folks that we would bring on, they were super talented, like all of you. But the thing that was hard to find and it's hard to read it, well, you can't see it on paper, is can they assimilate, and, and, and are they sort of, are they open to the possibilities, and do they work well in teams, and they've had any leadership experience, uh, and are, are, and so that's, and I can't tell you exactly how that's laid out, but you know, your, your, your extracurricular things that you do outside the school or the workplace will speak to that, and then how you present yourself, I mean, just be honest and, and genuine, and I know, I mean, how do you do that, right? Just, you just do. And that'll, that, that'll come across, and you know what, not everyone's gonna may pick up on it, because it's like, what, 30 minutes, sometimes to just look at a piece of paper before you have your, an interview. So don't, don't put all that pressure on yourself, because it's not a perfect system, it never is. But that's why the, the leveraging your network, too, and your relationships, and if you have others that can vouch for you, and. You know, I mean, you gotta try every lever you, you, you can and you have, uh, but, but that's what I look for. If I feel like, like it's less about this, like when I went to Disney, I mean, I, I didn't run any spreadsheets in the military. And so all the guys that I competed for for that job were in consulting and banks. And, and I was a little intimidated because I didn't do macros, you know, and, and I just didn't put PowerPoint presentations. But what they, I guess what they saw was so I could be myself really easily. I, I knew I wasn't gonna compete with all of them, but I could speak to the fact that I was thrown in these situations where I had to make some decisions and, 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 and some of them were, you know, involved people. And, uh, and then of course referrals all, always helps that you have people that can say, hey, this, this person's a good person. So yeah, I hope that helps some. Hi, thanks for uh, coming to talk to us today. Um, I'm wondering, do you see value in going to business school if you study business as an undergrad student? And if so, I guess, what, what particular aspects of that do you see value in today? Yeah, great, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I shared earlier, like my, my decision was very practical one. I was sh shifting careers, but I also always wanted to earn an MBA because, I mean, I, I saw it as a, sort of a, a leadership kind of environment where I could, um, you know, it, a lot of teamwork and, and the case study kind of approach really appealed to me. Uh, but I'm seeing less and less of folks that get into industry with an undergrad, depending on the industry. Uh, so I think it's a personal decision. Um, I, you know, it's, 
for, again, for, for, for me, it was just an ability to, to, to expand my horizons a bit more, expand my network. So shifting industry, expanding your network, um, and, th and that's been the biggest plus. Um, but it's a great, it's a great question. Um, I, you know, if, if you're sort of locked and loaded in your career path, and I see it in banking a lot, if you, or, or, you know, but in the corporate environment where you're expected to lead divisions and, and parts of organizations, it's, it doesn't, doesn't hurt, obviously, to, to, to earn an MBA and just, you know, have that experience as well. Are you considering, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Right. Right. No, yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, I go back from my five, ten. I went back from my twenty-year reunion, and 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 uh, as strong as the alumni. To your point, as strong as my undergrad alumni base is, it's what's interesting. It's the 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 MBA. It's it's even a, I, I found it to be a stronger network because I think you're also going through a lot of life experiences for the first time. You're you know everyone's starting to get married and and, and having kids and um, and you stay connected a little bit more in that life stage when you're you know post MBA. So yeah, definitely. It, Definitely is a powerful network, and that's a big reason to do it. Uh, thanks again for being here today. My name is Charles Adams. I'm an MSM candidate. Um, at Notre Dame, we really focus on asking more of business, and your example of uh, building the technician business in Sonify is a great example of that. Could you speak more to how you were able to convince your partners and fellow decision makers to not go for that immediate 20 million and really build that business into something more? No, it's a great, great question. I mean, for one, I, I, I was able to, because I had built, I had some credibility. I had worked, I, they saw what I was able to accomplish at Miramax and how we built a team of, of people and a whole new company that was sustaining, sustainable all on its own. So they knew that, that I had that experience and sense for, hey, you know, everything's, it's always a people-driven business, whatever you're doing, right? And so I, I, I had to give them a plan and, and with a time frame and certain mileposts that, and triggers that we would hit. And as long as we were hitting those, and then we were also doing some things. I also, what I also did is, I also, what I didn't share with you guys is, I also saw that we weren't charging for a lot of our maintenance services to our existing customers, only because the culture of the company had been, we've never charged, because we never did it before. And so anyway, I, I shifted that, that perception and culture too, and we started charging to our existing customer base, and that gave us some extra runway. So we were starting to recoup a little bit of that $20 million cost center while I was helping to build. Um, but I, I had to present a vision. And, 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 I, and I was very, very um, with conviction. <laughs> and, and to the point where I was sort of putting my, you know, my, myself out there and going, hey, this is how I want to do it. I only see it one way. Let's figure it out. You know? and, and then I also, I, I had some advocates within the organization of that technicians that were sort of strong leaders. And, and, and I gave them a platform and a voice to also have that interaction. They had never talked to senior management. So they didn't even also need to hear it from me. They heard it from some of the folks that I was, you know, I was starting to, 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 um, to, to let them, to empower them. And then that's, that's how we did it. And, we, and we, we had metrics. We reported. We had a scorecard. All those little things that you pick up in your business school classes, you know, because you take the emotion out of it, and all of a sudden, you know, at Disney, my early, my first career, my, my first job at Disney, there was a term we, we called, tr we, were tr we were truth seekers. I mean, it sounds a little cliche, but truth seekers. And even though we were these guys with HP 12C calculators, you know, we, we let the, the facts sort of drive some of the, the thinking. So 
let's not bring our own you know, emotions into it and everything else. And so, I, because I, we were able to put down a very solid plan and we stuck to it and yeah, it's been a, it's been a success. It's been great. Thank you. First off, I'd like to thank, thank uh, Tommy for being here today. I also want to set the record straight. Yeah, no, eleven and one. I'm Navy. Go Navy. Beat Irish. <laughs> now, now the other eleven games. Okay, let's go Irish. Right? Um, and now everybody else has to root for Navy over Air Force. Okay, because of strength of schedule with that loss against Navy, Irish is going to need that 11-1, you know, and Navy do as well as they can. So remember Strat that. He's now a strategist. Right, we got it all figured out. Okay. He's good. That's right. good Again, strategy. Thank you. Thanks Great very much. Work. Appreciate it. Thank you.